Oh, Ross, in Charlie Whiting, we've lost a dear friend and a highly valued colleague. Yeah, it, it's still not sunk in. Um, and, of course, after getting the news, you think about all the experiences you had together and how... Because he and I really grew up in Formula 1 together. He was a mechanic at Brabham when I was a mechanic at Williams. You know, our careers went slightly different paths, but I wouldn't think as many weeks when I didn't talk to him about something or other. And um, it's, it's going to leave a massive hole on a personal and professional level. What happened? How did you find out that uh, he died? Um, I was just going to breakfast this morning. I had a call from Jean, Jean Todd, to say that um, he'd been found dead in his room. And, uh, you know, it's one of those moments when you don't want to believe it or you don't believe it, because it can't have happened. It must be... And you're trying, you, your mind's sort of racing to think there must be a different explanation here that they, they haven't worked out yet. He was the centre of gravity of Formula <coughs> 1 in many respects. It's no disrespect to anybody to say he was probably one of the busiest, if not the busiest man in F1, dealing with the drivers, with safety, with the circuits, with the technical regulations. What very few people realise is that what he did here at the circuit for a race weekend was probably 5% of what he really did, because the rest of the time was working with the teams, working on regulations. He travelled an awful lot. Charlie's working week was always varied, but it was to say what happened here at the race was a tiny percentage of what he actually did, and that, that's going to leave a massive hole. I'll miss his laugh. He was always ready, a great company, uh, and laughed his head off at all times. But we sometimes used to poke him, go, well, you're a poacher turned gamekeeper, because when he was a mechanic at Brabham, he got up to all sorts of tricks, didn't he? And suddenly he became the scrutineer looking out for them. Well, I think they're the best judges, aren't they? Which is why when I worked, uh, you know, I was competing and I knew I couldn't pull the wool over his eyes. There was no point. If you did it and you got away with it and he found out, then you knew you were in trouble. He actually was not influenced by anyone. Even though he was used to work for Bernie and he worked for Jean, and he, he ploughed his own furrow in what he thought was right and what was correct. And everybody had huge respect for him because of that. You mentioned Jean and Bernie. You know, long-standing people, obviously, many decades. But I've spoken to some young drivers as well this afternoon. They're crestfallen. They're absolutely cut up because they had the same level of respect for him because he was authoritative but fair with them. Yeah, and that's, um, you know, that's something born of experience, born of your character. He had years of interaction with, with uh, some fairly challenging individuals in Formula 1. You know, it's a... It's a difficult environment, but he held his own in every situation. Yeah, you can't, you can't buy that respect. You can't just step in and expect to have it. It's there because of your history, because of what you've done, because your opinions are solid and, and because you're fair. And um, he can't be replaced.